Chapter 4 In National Politics No doubt it was the police strike of Boston that brought me into national prominence. That furnished the occasion, and I took advantage of the opportunity. I was ready to meet the emergency. Just what lay behind that event I was never able to learn. Sometimes I have mistrusted that it was a design to injure me politically. If so, it was only to recoil upon the perpetrators, for it increased my political power many-fold. Still, there was a day or two when the event hung in the balance, when the police commissioner of Boston, Edwin U. Curtis, was apparently cast aside, discredited, and my efforts to give him any support indicated my own undoing. But I soon had him reinstated, and there was a strong expression of public opinion in our favor. The year 1919 had not produced much on the positive side of our political life. President Wilson had returned from the peace conference at Paris, determined to have the United States join the League of Nations as established in the final Treaty of Versailles. He found opposition in the Senate, both within and without his own party. In attempting to gain the approval of the country, he had made his trip across the continent and returned a broken man, never to regain his strength. For eight years he had so dominated his party that it had not produced anyone else with the marketability for leadership. During these months the contest was raging in the Senate over the peace treaty, but as a result it had put the leadership of our party in a negative position, which never appeals to the popular imagination. And besides, in the country many Republicans favored a ratification of the treaty with adequate reservations. Many of the senators on our side cast their vote for that proposal which would have prevailed but for the opposition of the regular administration Democrats. In this confusion, no dominant popular figure emerged in the Congress, but many ambitions became apparent. Following my decisive victory in November, there very soon came to be mention of me as a presidential candidate. About Thanksgiving time, Senator Lodge came to me and voluntarily requested that he should present my name to the National Republican Convention. He wished to go as a delegate with that understanding. Of course I told him I could not make any decision in relation to being a candidate, but I would try to arrange matters so that he could be a delegate at large. When he left for Washington, he gave out an interview saying that Massachusetts should support me. Very soon a movement of considerable dimensions started both in my home state and in other sections of the country to secure delegates who would support me. An old friend and longtime secretary of the Republican National Committee, James B. Reynolds, was placed in charge of the movement and I was gaining considerable strength. Senator Crane, in his own quiet but highly efficient way, became very interested and let it be known that I had his support, as did Speaker Gillett, who is now our senator, but then represented my home district in Congress. They both went as delegates pledged to me. Already several candidates were making a very active campaign. The two most conspicuous were Major General Leonard Wood and Governor Frank O. Loden. Senator Hiram Johnson had considerable support and in a more modest way Senator Warren G. Harding was in the field. In addition to these, several of the states had favorite sons. It soon began to be reported that very large sums of money were being used in the primaries. When I came to give the matter serious attention and comprehended more fully what would be involved in a contest of this kind, I realized that I was not in a position to become engaged in it. I was governor of Massachusetts, and my first duty was to that office. It would not be possible for me, with the legislature in session, to be going about the country actively participating in an effort to secure delegates, and I was totally unwilling to have a large sum of money raised and spent in my behalf. I soon became convinced, also, that I was in danger of creating a situation in which some people in Massachusetts could permit it to be reported in the press that they were for me when they were not at heart for me, and would give me little support in the convention. It would, however, prevent their having to make a public choice as between other candidates, and would help them in getting elected as delegates. There was nothing unusual in this situation. It was simply a condition that always has to be met in politics. Of course, the strategy of the other candidates was to prevent me from having a solid Massachusetts delegation. Moreover, I did not wish to use the office of governor in an attempt to prosecute a campaign for nomination for some other office. I therefore made a public statement announcing that I was unwilling to appear as a candidate and would not enter my name in any contest at the primaries. This left me in a position where I ran no risk of embarrassing the great office of Governor of Massachusetts. That was my answer to the situation. <clears throat> 
Nevertheless, a considerable activity was kept up in my behalf, and some money expended, mostly in circulating a book of my speeches. In the Massachusetts primaries, six or seven delegates were chosen who were for General Wood, and while the rest were nominally for me, several of them were really more favorable to some other candidate, partly because they supposed a Massachusetts man could never be nominated, and if the choice was going outside the state, they had strong preferences as between the other possibilities. At a state convention held in South Dakota, held very early to express a preference for national candidates, I had been declared their choice for vice president. Some people in Oregon desired to accord me a like honor. As I did not wish my name to appear in any contest, and did not care to be vice president, I declined to be considered for that office. In my native state of Vermont, it was proposed to enter my name in the primary as candidate for president, which I could not permit. Nevertheless, it was written on the ballot by many of the voters at the polls. When the Republican National Convention met at Chicago, Senator Lodge, who was elected its chairman, had indicated that he did not wish to present my name, so it was arranged that Speaker Gillett should make the nominating speech. Massachusetts had 35 delegates. On the first ballot, I received 28 of their votes and six others from scattering states, making my total 34. As the balloting proceeded, a considerable number of Massachusetts delegates, feeling I had no chance, voted for other candidates. But a majority remained with me until the final ballot, when all but one went elsewhere, and Senator Warren G. Harding was nominated. My friends in the convention did all they could for me, and several states were at times ready to come to me if the entire Massachusetts delegation would lead the way, but some of them refused to vote for me, so the support of other states could not be secured. While I do not think it was so intended, I have always been of the opinion that this turned out to be much the best for me. I had no national experience. What I have ever been able to do has been the result of first learning how to do it. I am not gifted with intuition. I need not only hard work, but experience to be ready to solve problems. The presidents who have gone to Washington without first having held some national office have been at great disadvantage. It takes them a long time to become acquainted with the federal office holders and the federal government. Meanwhile, they have had difficulty in dealing with the situation. The convention of 1920 was largely under the domination of a coterie of United States senators. They maneuvered it into adopting a platform and nominating a president in ways that were not satisfactory to a majority of the delegates. When the same forces undertook for a third time to dictate the action of the convention in naming a vice president, the delegates broke away from them and literally stampeded to me. Massachusetts did not present my name, because my friends knew I did not wish to be vice president, but Judge Wallace McComet of Oregon placed me in nomination and was quickly seconded by North Dakota and some other states. I received about three-quarters of all the votes cast. When this honor came to me, I was pleased to accept, and it was especially agreeable to be associated with Senator Harding, whom I knew well and liked. When our campaign opened, the situation was complex. Many Republicans did not like the somewhat uncertain tone of the platform concerning the League of Nations. Though it was generally conceded that the bitter enders had dictated the platform, there were some who felt it was not explicit enough in denouncing the League with all its works and everything foreign and a much larger body of Republicans were much disappointed that it did not declare in favor of ratifying the treaty with reservations. The Massachusetts Republican Convention in the fall of 1919 had adopted a plank favoring immediate ratification with suitable reservations, which would safeguard American interests. While later the treaty had been rejected by the Senate, it was still necessary to make a formal agreement of peace with the Central Powers, and for that purpose some treaty would be necessary. Many Republicans favored our entry into the League as a method of closing up the war period and helping stabilize world conditions. Senator Crane had taken that position in Massachusetts and repeated it again at Chicago. Since that time, the situation has changed. The war period has closed and a separate treaty has been made and ratified. The more I have seen of the conduct of our foreign relations, the more I am convinced that we are better off out of the League. Our government is not organized in a way that would enable us adequately to deal with it. Nominally, our foreign affairs are in the hands of the President. Actually, the Senate is always attempting to interfere, too often in a partisan way, and many times in opposition to the President. Our country is not racially homogenous. While the several nationalities represented here are loyal to the United States, yet when differences arise between European countries, each group is naturally in sympathy with the nation of its origin. Our actions in the League would constantly be embarrassed by this situation at home. The votes of our delegates there would all the time disturb our domestic tranquility here. We have come to realize this situation very completely now, but in 1920 it was not so clear. 
At that time we were close to the war. Our sympathies were very much with our allies, and a great body of sentiment in our country, which may be called the missionary spirit, was strongly in favor of helping Europe. To them the League meant an instrument for that end. That was a praiseworthy spirit and had to be reckoned with in dealing with the people in a political campaign. This sentiment was very marked in the East, where it had a strong hold on a very substantial element of the Republican Party. While I was taking a short vacation in Vermont, several thousand people came to my father's home to greet me. I spent most of my time, however, in preparing my speech of acceptance. The notification ceremonies were held on a pleasant afternoon in midsummer at Northampton in Allen Field, which was part of the college grounds, and its former president, the Venerable Dr. L. Clark Seeley, presided. The chairman of the notification committee was Governor Morrow of Kentucky. A great throng representing many different states was in attendance to hear my address. I was careful to reassure those who feared we were not proposing to continue our cooperation with Europe in attempting to solve the war problems in a way that would provide for a permanent peace of the world. Not being the head of the ticket, of course, it was not my place to raise issues or create policies, but I had the privilege of discussing those already declared in the platform or stated in the addresses of Senator Harding. This I undertook to do in a speech I made at Portland, Maine, where I again pointed out the wish of our party to have our country associated with other countries in advancing human welfare. Later in the campaign I reiterated this position at New York. This was not intended as a subterfuge to win votes, but as a candid statement of party principles. It was later to be put into practical effect by President Harding in the important treaty dealing with our international relations in the Pacific Ocean, in the agreement for the limitation of naval armaments, in the proposal to enter the world court, and finally by me in the World Peace Treaty. All that I said and more in justification of support for the Republican ticket by those interested in promoting peace, without committing our country to interfere where we had little interest, had been abundantly borne out by the events. Shortly before election, I made a tour of eight days, going from Philadelphia by special train west to Tennessee and Kentucky, and south as far as North Carolina. We had a most encouraging reception on this trip speaking out of doors, mostly from the rear platform during the day, with an indoor meeting at night. During the campaign, I spoke in about a dozen states. The country was already feeling acutely the results of deflation. Business was depressed. For months following the armistice, we had persisted in a course of much extravagance and reckless buying. Wages had been paid that were not earned. The whole country, from the national government down, had been living on borrowed money. Payday had come and it was found our capital had been much impaired. In an address at Philadelphia, I contended that the only sure method of relieving this distress was for the country to follow the advice of Benjamin Franklin and begin to work and save. Our productive capacity is sufficient to maintain us all in a state of prosperity if we give sufficient attention to thrift and industry. Within a year, the country had adopted that course, which has brought an era of great plenty. When the election came, it appeared that we had practically the entire Republican vote and had gained enormously from all those groups who have been in this country so short a time that they still retain a marked race consciousness. Many of them had left Europe to escape from the prevailing conditions there. While they were loyal to the United States, they did not wish to become involved in any old world disputes, were greatly relieved that the war was finished, and generally opposed to the League of Nations. Such a combination gave us an overwhelming victory. After election, it was necessary for me to attend a good many celebrations. My hometown of Northampton had a large mass meeting at which several speeches were made. In Boston, a series of dinners and lunches were given in my honor. Shortly before Christmas, Mrs. Coolidge and I paid a brief visit to Mr. and Mrs. Harding at their home in Marion, Ohio. They received us in the most gracious manner. It was no secret to us why their friends had so much affection for them. We discussed at length the plans for his administration. The members of his cabinet were considered and he renewed the invitation to me, already publicly expressed, to sit with them. The policies he wished to adopt for restoring the prosperity of the country by reducing taxes and revising the tariff were referred to more casually. He was sincerely devoted to the public welfare and desirous of improving the conditions of the people. When at last another governor was inaugurated to take my place and the guns on Boston Common were giving him their first salute, Mrs. Coolidge and I were leaving for home from the North Station on the afternoon train, which I had used so much before I was governor. It had only day coaches and no parlor car, but we were accustomed to, 
It was a clear but crisp spring day out of doors, where the oath was administered to the president. During the winter, I made an address before the Vermont Historical Society at Montpelier, and spoke later at the town hall in New York for a group of ladies who were restoring the birthplace of Theodore Roosevelt. After a brief stay at Northampton, Mrs. Coolidge and I went to Atlanta, where I spoke before the Southern Tariff Association. A great deal of hospitality was lavished upon us by the state officials and the people in the city. In a few days, we went to Asheville, North Carolina, where we remained about two weeks. The Grove Park Inn entertained us with everything that could be wished, and the region was delightful. When the Massachusetts electors met, Judge Henry P. Field of the firm where I read law, who had moved my admission to the bar, now had the experience of nominating me for vice president. Twenty-four years had intervened between these two services, which he performed for me. The time had come for us to go to Washington. A large crowd of our friends was at the station to bid us goodbye, although the hour was very early. We went a few days before March 4th in order to have a little time to get settled. The Vice President and Mrs. Marshall met us and gave us every attention and courtesy. When Mr. and Mrs. Harding arrived, we went to the station to meet them, and they took us back with them to the New Willard, where we too were staying. In the White House car, President Wilson sent for them. About 10.30 the next morning, a committee of the Congress came to escort us to the White House, where the President and Mrs. Wilson joined us, and we went to the Capitol. Soon, President Wilson sent for me, and said his health was such it would not be wise for him to remain for the inauguration, and bade me goodbye. I never saw him again except at a distance, but he sent me a most sympathetic letter when I became president. Such was the passing of a great world figure. As I had already taken a lead part in seven inaugurations and witnessed four others in Massachusetts, the experience was not new to me, but I was struck by the lack of order and formality that prevailed. A part of the ceremony takes place in the Senate chamber, and a part on the east portico, which destroys all semblance of unity and continuity. I was sworn in before the Senate, and made a very brief address dwelling on the great value of a deliberative body as a safeguard for our liberties. It was a clear but crisp spring day out of doors, where the oath was administered to the President by Chief Justice White. The inaugural address was able and well received. President Harding had an impressive delivery, which never failed to interest and hold his audience. I was to hear him many times in the next two years, but whether on formal occasions or in the freedom of gridiron dinners, his charm and effectiveness never failed. When the inauguration was over, I realized that the same thing for which I had worked in Massachusetts had been accomplished in the nation. The radicalism which had tinged our whole political and economic life from soon after 1900 to the World War period was past. There were still echoes of it, and some of its votaries remained, but its power was gone. The country had little interest in mere destructive criticism, it wanted the progress that alone comes from constructive policies. It had been our intention to take a house in Washington, but we found none to our liking. They were too small or too large. It was necessary for me to live within my income, which was little more than my salary, and was charged with the cost of sending my boys to school. We therefore took two bedrooms with a dining room, and large reception room at the New Willard, where we had every convenience. It is difficult to conceive a person finding himself in a situation which calls on him to maintain a position he cannot pay for. Any other course for me would have been cut short by the barnyard philosophy of my father, who would have contemptuously referred to such action as a senseless imitation of a fowl which was attempting to light higher than it could roost. There is no dignity quite so impressive, and no independence quite so important, as living within your means. In our country a small income is usually less embarrassing in the possession of a large one. But my experience has convinced me that an official residence with suitable maintenance should be provided for the vice president. Under the present system, he is not lacking in dignity, but he has no fixed position. The great office should have a settled and permanent habitation, and a place irrespective of the financial ability of its temporary occupant. While I was glad to be relieved of the responsibility of a public establishment, nevertheless, it is a duty the second officer of the nation should assume. It would be much more in harmony with our theory of equality if each vice president held the same position in the capital city. Very much is said and written concerning the amount of dining out that the vice president does. As the president is not available for social dinners, of course, the next officer in rank is much sought after for such occasions. But like everything else that is sent out of Washington for public consumption, the reports are exaggerated. Probably the average of these dinners during the season does not exceed three a week 
and as the Senate is in session after 12 o'clock each weekday, there is no opportunity for lunches or teas. When we first went to Washington, Mrs. Coolidge and I quite enjoyed the social dinners. As we were always the ranking guests, we had the privilege of arriving last and leaving first, so that we were usually home by 10 o'clock. It will be seen that this was far from burdensome. We found it a most enjoyable opportunity for getting acquainted, and could scarcely comprehend how anyone who had the privilege of sitting at a table surrounded by representatives of the Cabinet, the Congress, the Diplomatic Corps, and the Army and Navy would not find it interesting. Presiding over the Senate was fascinating to me. That branch of the Congress has its own methods and traditions, which may strike the outside as peculiar, but more familiarity with them would disclose that they are only what long experience has demonstrated to be the best methods of conducting its business. It may seem that debate is endless, but there is scarcely a time when it is not informing, and after all, the power to compel due consideration is the distinguishing mark of a deliberative body. If the Senate is anything, it is a great deliberative body, and if it is to remain a safeguard of liberty, it must remain a deliberative body. I was entertained and instructed by the debates. However it may appear in the country, no one can become familiar with the inside workings of the Senate without gaining a great respect for it. The country is safe in its hands. At first I intended to become a student of the Senate rules, and I did learn much about them, but I soon found that the Senate had but one fixed rule, subject to exceptions, of course, which was to the effect that the Senate would do anything it wanted to do whenever it wanted to do it. When I had learned that, I did not waste much time on the other rules, because they were so seldom applied. The assistant to the Secretary of the Senate could be relied on to keep me informed on other parliamentary questions, but the President of the Senate can and does exercise a good deal of influence over its deliberations. The Constitution gives him the power to reside, which is the power to recognize whom he will. That often means that he decides what business is to be taken up, and who is to have the floor for debate at any specific time. Nor is the impression that it is a dilatory body never arriving at decisions correct. In addition to acting on the thousands of nominations and the numerous treaties, it passes much more legislation than the House. But it is true that unanimous consent is often required to close debate, and because of the great power each senator is therefore permitted to exercise, which is often a veto power, making one senator a majority of the 96 senators, great care should be exercised by the states in their choice of senators. Nothing is more dangerous to good government than great power in improper hands. If the Senate has any weakness, it is because the people have sent to that body men lacking the necessary ability and character to perform the proper functions. But this is not the fault of the Senate. It cannot choose its own members, but has to work with what is sent to it. The fault lies back in the citizenship of the states. If the Senate does not function properly, the blame is chiefly on them. If the Vice President is a man of discretion and character, so that he can be relied upon to act as a subordinate in such position, he should be invited to sit with the Cabinet, although some of the Senators, wishing to be the only advisers of the President, do not look on that proposal with favor. He may not help much in his deliberations, and only on rare occasions would he be a useful contact with the Congress, although his advice on the sentiment of the Senate is of much value but he should be in the cabinet, because he might become president, and ought to be informed on the policies of the administration. He will not learn of all of them. Much went on in the departments under President Harding, as it did under me, of which the cabinet had no knowledge. But he will hear much, and learn how to find out more, if it ever becomes necessary. My experience in the cabinet was of supreme value to me when I became president. It was my intention when I became vice president to remain in Washington avoid speaking, and attend to the work of my office. But the pressure to speak is constant and intolerable. However, I resisted most of it. I was honored by the President by his request to make the dedicatory address at the unveiling of a bust of him in the McKinley Memorial at Niles, Ohio. I also delivered the address at the dedication of the Grant statue in Washington. <coughs> During these two years, I spoke some and lectured some. This took me about the country in travels that reached from Maine to California, from the Twin Cities to Charleston. I was getting acquainted. Aside from speeches, I did little writing, but I read a great deal and listened much. While I little realized it at the time, it was for me a period of most important preparation. It enabled me to be ready in August 1923. An extra session of the Congress began in April of 1921, which was almost continuous until March 4th, 1923. While an enormous amount of work was done, it soon became apparent that the country expected too much from the change in administration. The government could and did stop the waste of the people's savings, but it could not restore them. That had to be done by the hard work and thrift of the people themselves. This would take time. 
While the country was improving, it was still depressed. There was some unemployment and a good deal of distress in agriculture because of the very low prices of farm produce and the shrinkage in land values. When I began to make political speeches in the campaign of 1922, I soon realized that the country had large sections that were disappointed because a return of prosperity had not been instantaneous. Moreover, the people had little knowledge of the great mass of legislation already accomplished, which was to prove so beneficial to them within a few months in the future. After I related some of the record of the relief measures adopted, they would come to me and say they had never heard of it and thought nothing to, had been done. While my party still held both the House and the Senate, it lost many seats in the election, which made the closing session of Congress full of complaints tinged with bitterness against an administration under which many of them had been defeated. That being the natural reaction, it is, it is useless to discuss its propriety. While these years in Washington had been full of interest, they were not without some difficulties. Its official circles never accept anyone gladly. There is always a certain unexpressed sentiment that a new arrival is appropriating the power that should rightfully belong to them. He is always regarded as in the nature of a usurper. But I think I met less of this sentiment than is usual, for I was careful not to be obtrusive. Nevertheless, I could not escape being looked on as one who might be given something that others wished to have. But as soon as it became apparent that I was wholly engaged in promoting the work of the Senate and the success of the administration, rather than my own interests, I was more cordially accepted. In these two years, I witnessed the gigantic task of demobilizing a war government and restoring it to a peacetime basis. I also came in contact with many of the important people of the United States and foreign countries. All talent eventually arrives at Washington. Most of the world figures were there at the Conference on Limitation of Armaments. Other meetings brought people only a little less distinguished. While I had little official connection with these events, the delegates called on me, and I often met them on social occasions. The efforts of President Harding to restore the country became familiar to me. I saw the steady increase of the wise leadership of Mr. Hughes and Mr. Mellon in the administration of the government, and the passing of some of the veteran figures of the Senate. Chief among these was Senator Knox of Pennsylvania. He was a great power, and had a control of the conduct of the business of the Senate, which he exercised in behalf of our party policies, that no one else approached during my service in Washington. In the winter of 1923, President Harding was far from well. At his request, I took his place in delivering the address at the budget meeting. While he was out again in a few days, he never recovered. As Mrs. Coolidge and I were leaving for the long recess on the 4th of March, I bade him goodbye. We went to Virginia Hot Springs for a few days and then returned to Massachusetts, where we remained while I filled some speaking engagements, and in July went to Vermont. We left the President and Mrs. Harding in Washington. I do not know what had impaired his health. I do know that the weight of the presidency is very heavy. Later it was disclosed that he had discovered that some whom he had trusted had betrayed him, and he had been forced to call them to account. It is known that this discovery was a very heavy grief to him, perhaps more than he could bear. I never saw him again. In June he started for Alaska and eternity.